It's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. Welcome to Projections, our weekly show about virtual reality and augmented reality. Something we never get to talk about. Oh, rarely. But yes. we're going to talk about AR today yes. because a new product we're reviewing is Lenovo and Disney's Star Wars Jedi Challenges, AR. Uh, we've had this for about a week. We've tested it here and also home mm -hmm. with family members. Uh, but let's explain what this is. Sure, so this is a $200 box that you put your phone in. So that's an important detail. It needs a phone in order to work and they say that it does work on any size phone and iPhone as well as Android. Yeah, what's interesting is when you think of an AR device, uh, you obviously need some type of screen to project and the image into the real world, and they're using um, a reflection, right? Mm -hmm. So they have what looks, actually looks a lot like Luke Skywalker's uh, blast shield. We see what we want to see. Yeah, we see binoculars, we see something Star Wars, but it protrudes pretty far from your face because there's an optical system here where there are mirrors, and it bounces it and projects it basically to somewhere in front of you, like a couple feet in front of you. Well, it projects it pretty far in front of you. I mean, the, the, illusion, yes, the illusion of the three dimensions it, it extends past your walls, typically, in any standard size room. I mean, right. um, up to pretty close to you. So yes, the phone sits in here, face down. It runs the app. And you're wondering, well, how could it work with any size phone screen? Yeah. They took the lowest common de denominator here, and they took a small phone screen and use so it uses that much of your screen no matter what screen you have. Right. So right. if you have a larger screen, it will only use a subset of the pixels. Yeah. So for example, they let us test this with uh, one of the Motorola phones, yeah. which is a pretty lightweight phone because weight is going to be a factor here. And as you can see, it actually only uses, I would say, it looks like at most 70% mm -hmm. of the screen. There's definitely a huge slice of it that's cut out. Yeah. Uh, and then also different phones have different connectors, right? Because you do need to connect your phone to this headset. This headset has some cameras in it that allow it to keep its uh, orientation relative to this puck which you put on the floor. It tells it where the ground is. Right, and Lenovo, uh, which has a lot of experience with uh, Google Tango devices, uh, was in charge of this uh, alignment system, this tracking system, and uh, and so you, there is an adapter, right? So for their example, this phone is USB-C, and then adapter plugs in a micro USB, but they also include in the box adapters for micro USB phones, or on the Apple iOS side, uh, lightning, lightning cable cool. to micro USB. So this plugs in, and you know it's a little bit of a learning curve. You have to there's little sliders here to tighten the phone mm -hmm. and get it aligned so the window fits. And even on the phone they provided, the camera bulge in the back, for example, was pretty big. It keeps it from getting perfectly aligned. It's not perfect. It takes, you may have to make your own little spacers yeah. to put in here yourself. And when it's not aligned, uh, that affects the alignment of the world because of your stereoscopic imagery. Sometimes you see a little element of your left eye from your right eye, like a slice, and so that can break the illusion a little bit. Yeah. Also, just the process of having to like launch an app, put it in the shell, put it into the headset, close the, get, get the wires connected, it's a process. Right, so if you're getting this for a kid, for example, even a kid with their own phone, it's a lot, it's not just a pick up and play. Right. It's a turn your phone on, launch the app, slide the phone in, and then make sure everything's charged, because you're talking about charging your phone, you're talking about charging the beacon here, and also the lightsaber accessory. I don't think this charges, I think this oh, is it's battery powered. Oh, it's batteries, yeah. yep. Um, having everything charged up, yeah. and then running, and then you get into the experience. Okay, is that enough disclaimers? Yes, so okay. the experience, <laughs> all right. Uh, lightsaber is your meta method of interaction. Two buttons. You have the button on top, which is your standard lightsaber button, and then you have this one up here, which uh, acts as a secondary button, and in game, it acts as a recentering button. Recalibration. Yeah, which was you point it forward, and then you hit this, and your your saber will realign. Yeah. Personally, I never got perfect alignment playing this game. I, it was very difficult. My saber was always maybe an inch to the right. Also, interestingly, when I had the puck at home. Uh, it, everything was oriented about six inches below my floor. Oh. So as I played, it was as if my, you know, my floor was a hologram and everything was a little bit beneath it. I think that might be because I had a reflective floor. Because mm. when I played here, it seemed like everything was at the proper height. 
Got I it. wish that there was an adjustment for that. It doesn't yeah. seem like it would be too hard to make a settings menu with an offset for your floor and, and your saber. I mean, they could have designed this, they could have designed the games, because once you get things actually floating in your real world, yeah. they could have designed something that you play with a Bluetooth controller, like a gamepad, but mm. instead they want it full on immersion, right? The appeal of this is that you're holding a replica lightsaber prop that lights up, that has a glowing light projected be a blade, and also then enemies coming at you. Right. And I mean, okay, so even with the offset lightsaber and the things floating in the wrong spot, I think the experiences are more compelling than I expected. Mm. So there's really three experiences, and they break it down into like combat and leadership and intelligence. Right. Um, so you've got your combat, which is your, your saber fighting, and you play different bad guys throughout the this, this series. Uh, you know, from, uh, you know, there's Kylo Ren, there's Darth Vader, there's... Uh, Some battle droids. The guys yep. with the horns. Yep. Ugh. And then, and you, you progress through those guys. You can only fight one, and then you fight the next, and the next, and the next. And uh, then there's also a RTS game, which yeah. is completely different, where you're standing way above the, the field, and the there's battlefield. all these units around you. And it's actually a much wider field of view, uh, not, not in terms of what you can see, but in terms of what you can turn to see, right. than, than the combat game. And, and then you're actually using your gaze and this to choose units in a, in a holographic display, you click on them and then you place them where you want them, and then they kind of have a mind of their own. And then finally, there's also the Jarek Hollow Chess. So they don't call it the Jarek. No, though. they don't, because the rule set isn't exactly the Jarek rule set. Right. But it is the Hollow Chess that you see on the Millennium Falcon? It is on a pedestal, floats up. You see the holographic characters, and this is an experience where you're really encouraged to get up close, look at the miniatures, mm -hmm. look at the characters, and then you can direct them strategy-wise, turn-based strategy-wise, one at a time to attack the other uh, characters. Yeah, and that, that's a good point about getting up close. You can do that in the RTS game too. You can walk around the battle field. As long as this remains visible to the headset, you can walk 360 around things. Yeah. If this loses the, this, the puck, then it doesn't know where it is. It kind of still uses the gyro to keep a general orientation, but it doesn't know where center is anymore. With the combat, you're pretty much standing in one spot. Yeah, and in terms of like the type of interactions in the, with the real world, those three are pretty like well balanced, right? You have yeah. one which is a character, which is human size, in your physical space. Alignment, again, isn't perfect. They don't know where your walls are. It's best played in a large room, a large living room, for example. Right. You're not really encouraged to jump around dance around the enemy, you can duck and you can dodge. In fact, you have to. Later in the game, as you progress, one of the skills you have to develop is dodging left, right, and down, which actually, it makes it a lot more fun. But it's like fighting a ghost, right? Totally. Fighting a ghost that's kind of, yes, floating around, walking around, yeah. and then maybe coming towards you at times. And then there's the Jarek, or the hollow chest, which is, I think, more near field oriented, mm. and that's getting up close and inspecting details, and there, the slight movements around the characters are important, and I think that tracked pretty well. And then the, the real-time strategy game, the strategy game is like God view landscape, which mm -hmm. is like shows like then you're encur really encouraging your head to move around. Yeah. So three really different types of AR, mm -hmm. the best they could do. The problem, I think, is twofold, at least for me. Yeah. One is controller, right? Right. Lightsaber makes a lot of sense. You're holding controller. The alignment, I, there's a little latency, a little offset. I think you can deal with that once you're in the game. Right. But there's only one button it really limits your ability to interact more in a, more comprehensively with right. the other games. Within the combat, there's really little button pressing at all. It's all about actually there's sort of quick time events where they put the, I guess it's supposed to be your intuition, they put these ghosts of a lightsaber on, in 3D space and you have to align the saber with it to defend the oncoming attack. Once you build up enough force power, you can then press the button to push back or use a shield or whatever force power you've unlocked, yeah. but not a whole lot of button pressing. When, with the RTS, I was actually kind of surprised how well they used only one button because it had to do with where this was held. If it's up here, you then scroll through a menu automatically, you choose your unit, and then you place it. Uh, otherwise, you can just gaze at certain things and then press the button with this out of your field of view. It has a different effect. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not like RTS where you're selecting units and you're dragging things and making things move. Well, why couldn't it be? They have tracking points. They have a gyro in there. They know where that tip yeah. of that lightsaber is. They could have made it a laser pointer and grab units. It seemed like they just didn't want to put as complicated a strategy game to work within the limitations of the AR headset with the field of view yeah. and the graphical and computational powers of a phone. It's the Jarek versus hollow chest. Like right. it, it is the dumbed down version of what it could be. Yeah, but even the dumbed down version of lightsaber battles 
It's compelling. You put it on your kids, they enjoy it? They both actually really liked it. Uh, the younger one, the seven-year-old, thought it was amazing. The older one, the 10-year-old, who has a lot of VR experience, um, a little less so, a little more meh about it because the tracking and the fidelity is not like any VR experience. Yeah, if um, you're used to VR, used to room scale, or even used to using your Oculus, uh, you're gonna be disappointed, I think, yeah, no, in the latency and the tracking. The latency, particularly when you move your head, things shift with you and then they shift back. Now, because you can actually see the real world, there's no motion sickness concerns at all. Mm -hmm. That's one of the benefits that we know about AR to begin with. And, you know, it creates an, an illusion for $200 plus a phone. That is pretty compelling. I mean, I think if you see anybody using this, you're going to want to try it. But whether you want to actually spend the money to own one and whether you're going to get $200 worth of entertainment from it, yeah. that's, I mean, if you have a family, I think that's going to be, uh, you're going to get more value out of it. But just for yourself, I mean, they're saying that they're going to work on more experiences. Mm -hmm. It could be DLC in the future. Uh, but I would really like to see if you're going to have this and you have a beacon, you have the headset, you have a, one type of controller, more interactive games with different types of controllers um, and, and taking advantage of that. I think it proves that home AR on a wide commercial standpoint can work, uh, but set the expectations um, and I think it's, a, it's a early years. I think it's a, diff it's a really interesting product because it is both an expensive toy and a cheap AR product. Yeah. So like, where do those two meet? Right. It, it ends up being this, and we haven't seen anything like this on the market before. So I'll be curious to see what kind of success, success it does have. Because I think for the right audience, it's actually kind of cool. I do think that there's a lot of, uh, uh, is, what's the difference between depth and breadth with games? But like, right. there's, there's certainly like, you experience all there is to, to do, in about a half an hour, right. but then there's a lot of unlocks and progression throughout the world. You go to these different planets, eventually you unlock this center realm. So there's a, there's a lot of gameplay there. It's just kind of recycling kind of, what yeah. you've already done. Not to say it's easy though, because it does get pretty hard. Yeah, Some absolutely. Of those fights. Yeah, it's pretty. It, yeah. Yeah, and then you know if you're looking for something for Thanksgiving or Christmas, this can probably keep your family and extended family occupied all Thanksgiving. Yeah. So there's something to say about that. The other experience we wanted to talk about this week, it's not a review, but we have spent a couple hours with the official uh, release of From Other Suns. Right, yeah. Yes. Now, we've talked about this game before. It is a sort of a roguelike FTL style, you know, first person perspective VR game where you and up to two other friends get together and you have a ship. And then there is a mission where you have to return back to Earth. And it seems um, it's like every game is that same mission, but the branch that you take and the bad guys that you meet along the way are different every time. Procedurally generated. And I would best describe this as maybe a firefly simulator. Oh, well, that's, that's, don't that's, oversell it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in command of a ship. And when we jumped in, yeah? you know, we were the captains of, of the shared ship and we had an engine room. You can, we can send our third AI character to go repair the med bay or repair our shields. Like it felt like bridge commander, except expanded to the full ship. You mean bridge crew? Bridge crew, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I was getting that too. And and when you first get in here with a buddy, it actually that's a, it's a good feeling. Yeah. The graphics are good. You're exploring. You don't know what's going to happen next. Especially then when things happen and you have to teleport over to an enemy ship and maybe have some confrontations. It's exciting. Once you start to recognize some of the modules the from patterns, ship to ship, yeah, yeah. The, the, what they're using to make these these levels, then it's like okay, I, I recognize that. Still, you don't always know narratively what's going to happen next, mm -hmm. and you don't know how difficult the bad guys are going to be. Right, and which wide rangely from jumping into a huge boss fight with dozens of enemies swarming us, where we it was heated. We were looking for weapons, recharging weapons, yeah. needed cooperation. We we're struggling holding up our shields. That was thrilling. To buggy experiences where we teleport onto a pirate ship, another vessel, mm -hmm. and all the AI. Crew members were just standing still. It wasn't like field of view either. You get right up in their faces and they just wouldn't do anything until you nudged them or shot them and then they get very upset. I, I was hoping that that was like part of the story where <laughs> we teleport back to the ship and whoever sent that distress signal yeah. was like, oh, I'd actually frozen the, ca the, the crew and, and suckered you off their ship. And it just, you now we encountered multiple instances where the AI just was buggy or wasn't responsive. Which yeah. I, I assume they can fix this, but at yeah. launch, that's not so great. We are playing what they are calling the release build before release, so this is potentially something they could even fix yeah. before release day. But even assuming all that stuff, you know, there's combat, but then there's also this, this role-playing aspect, yeah. right? You are uh, building up your crew, you're building up your ship, uh, you are accumulating weapons, like there's a Borderlands 
feel to looking at the specs between the weapons. Oh, I found someone with a great machine gun, a great disc thrower. These are what I want to keep in my inventory. Yeah. There's a great uh, feeling of like I'm hacking the ship where I'm like resuscitating you by stabbing a met stim pack on you. Like all this stuff felt mechanically great. I just don't know how deep it goes. Right. Well, yeah, we like you said, we've only made it sort of halfway back to Earth. And that particularly that last mission that we were on that was really difficult, uh, where you you died and I we, I guess we both died, and I took over the last remaining human character, you became a robot. Um, it, that, that was actually the most compelling part for me when it really got difficult. Yeah. And if we're only halfway home, I could see more things like that happening. And I, what I really wanted though, after that difficult mission, was to reap rewards. Unfortunately, I didn't feel like that was there so right. much. Like we got a little bit more currency, and we fuel. found we found we didn't find enough fuel. <laughs> like I that's mean, that's, what, that's that's the what scarce we resource, right? You yeah. got to get the the goal is to get back to Earth. Yeah, we made it over fifty percent, but once you run out of fuel, that's it, or have to call in distress signal. So it's about like I think I guess exploring the different systems, not going taking a straight path to Earth, mm -hmm. but finding the different mission types. Um, and buy that fuel when it's offered to you, buy, man. I'll totally buy that fuel. But, you know, we felt like, I'm afraid there's not enough depth there. Like, there's yeah. going on to other ships. There's going to other, other uh, space stations. Uh, the enemies will board you. But we didn't get a lot of twists and turns in the narrative. Like, I really enjoyed like Mass Effect. I liked when the, en when the enemies boarded us. That was really like an invasion. Yeah. Uh, whereas we had been boarding other people the whole time. We found some pirates that just came aboard our ship and they started destroying our resources. And you have to walk around your ship with a repair gun while taking the enemies out. And mm -hmm. there's definitely a sense of risk going on. I also like that this lets you jump in and out as need be. Like if I want to continue playing, I could start my save game and yeah. you can jump in whenever you want and take over one of the AI characters on the ship up to three people. I feel like I'm gonna want more than three. Like, I don't know what the perfect number is. You know, we have a lot of fun four players uh, in a game like Rec Room, mm -hmm. but I, and I, three definitely, I feel like it's gonna be more fun than two, but in my mind, I kinda want like six people. I hear you. Yeah. I don't know, I think three is good. The, the whole bridge is set up for three people, so you can actually have somebody at the front who's more or less a captain. They can control all the different stations, like tactical and defense and- Comms. Uh, and right, and get, you get a map of your, of your whole ship. And then you have these two substations in the back, which yeah. are just for tactical and uh, like communicating with your AIs and sending them around the ship. Yep. Yeah, which when we get three people in there, even with two people, one yeah. person managing the, the, the AI, one person managing the tactical, it felt very much like, like I said, like, like Firefly-esque. We were, we were working together to save our ship. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, we want, we're definitely going to play more of it. But all I can say right now is the first two hours is awesome. Yeah, I just, I want more. Like, like I feel like this game could, has the potential to be amazing, like really, really good. And, it, and I like what they've got so far as a boilerplate. I just want more rewards with the things and I, and I just want, like you were suggesting more narratively mm -hmm. to go on. Then again, we're not all the way to earth yet. You yep. know, we'll, we'll finish this mission and see what we think. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, it's a great start. And I hope that this game has legs so that they can continue to iterate on it. Like a lot of VR social games, what you bring to it, the friends you play with, adds so much more to the experience and compounds the, just, just the thrill. Um, definitely find two friends to play it with. I yeah. think it's totally worth trying out. From Other Sons, it's out in I think a week or so, and we'll be playing more and talking more about it in the future. Uh, but until then, thanks for watching this week. We'll be back next week with another episode of Projections, more stuff to talk about. But until then, we'll see you in VR. Bye.